Welcome to the AUA Leadership and Business Podcast, where urologic professionals experience the practical application of business acumen essential to successfully navigating today's rapidly changing business environment. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Today's show is the business aspects of urology and healthy financial practices that are absolutely mandatory for sustained, high-quality care delivery. I am Dr. Jennifer Miles Thomas, and I'm here today with my guest, Dr. David Green. I just wanted to introduce myself. I am Dr. Jennifer Miles Thomas. I am the president and CEO of Urology of Virginia, which is a large urology group. I practice female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, and I am very um, honored today to have our special guest, Dr. David Green. Well, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the topic today. So when we finish residency, we are all fairly confident in our ability to develop and deliver high quality urologic care. But we have this wide skill set that really applies to our patients and patient care. But once we're actually in practice, we recognize that we do have that clinical ability, but sometimes we don't always know what the quality aspects are that we should be delivering. So sometimes we feel that other aspects of the business, such as staffing, organizational structures, finances, it kind of interferes sometimes with our ability to give the quality care that we think we should be giving. There are limitations that are professional as well as personal. And we have to make sure that for the long term, we are satisfied with our delivery of care to our patients. So regardless of our practice, whether we're private, employed, academic, the business aspects are also important, they're challenging, and they're also holding us back. So for today's guest, I wanna introduce Dr. David Green. He completed his urologic training at Yale, during which time he spent a year working at St. James University Hospital in Leeds, UK. Following residency, he joined the faculty at Yale and was an early AUA scholar. In 1987, he joined a two-person private practice in Concord, New Hampshire, which has grown to nine urologists and eight advanced uh, providers. In 2006, Dr. Green became the first CMO of Concord Hospital and organized the Concord Medical Group, tripling the size of that group during his 14-year tenure. He also served as the CEO of a five-hospital Medicare ACO, New Hampshire Accountable Care Partners. He recently completed his four-year term as treasurer of the AUA. I would like to welcome Dr. David Green. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So we can get right into it. Uh, I think one of the things we need to do is clearly define. So what is high quality care delivery and what are the components of it? Well, Jennifer, that's a really great question, and I am often think of uh, Justice Potter Stevens when asked about pornography. Uh, He said he didn't know how to define it, but he knew it when he saw it. And um, so many times, um, I think that's the way quality is seen. And I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, Hopefully, we went to a residency program where the focus was on making us technically good Uh, providers. And um, we just kind of took it for granted um, that the clinic ran the way it did, hopefully well, um, that there was um, a very functional and safe culture uh, amongst um, the program. Um, But how do we create that? Or if there is uh, a dysfunction uh, in a practice that we've joined, how do we influence and turn that around? And you're absolutely at the nail on the head when you said, no, this applies to folks in private practice, um, in large urology groups, in academic settings, in hospital-owned practices. Um, we all want to deliver high-quality care, and we all have been trained um, to do state-of-the-art uh, care But that's not enough. How do we um, set things up uh, for success? So um, it isn't readily apparent, and there isn't one size fits all. And um, from personal experience, um, you need to be able to define um, for your group, for your community, 
what this uh, means. So uh, we could make a laundry list of the components of quality care. Um, certainly a good outcomes would be on that list, um, but appropriate care, timely care, access, continuity of care, the value or affordability of the care, the integration with other practices, with a hospital, with insurance companies, um, state of the art of your facilities are important. Um, so again, uh, we could go on and on with that. What we did, and I think it's really important, um, we saw a great opportunity maybe 20 uh, years ago when we were a four uh, person group. And um, things are pretty easy when you're in a small group, but you can reach anonymity on a lot of things. Um, but we dedicated some Saturdays uh, to go through a facilitated discussion uh, about just what was important to us. How did we define quality? And even though there were only four of us, when you sit down and then you ask that question, you come up oftentimes with four um, different sets of responses, none of which are right or wrong, um, but you have to reach consensus on it. Because although talking about mission, vision, and values can sometimes make a doctor's eyes glaze over, um, Nonetheless, that was the most important thing to me as a chief medical officer. All of my decisions were based on um, what the mission uh, was. And while you may not need to formally call it that, uh, for your practice, no matter what the environment, no matter what the size of it is, you have to have a pretty um, good agreement on what your goals, priorities, purpose, and vision um, you have to define it. Uh, you have to be able to measure it if you're going to improve that quality. Um, and again, I would give one example where when we looked at our practice, um, we felt that what our community, what our referring docs most needed um, was that when a man was referred to us with an elevated PSA, that that individual be um, given almost immediate access to the practice. They received their biopsy within uh, two weeks. We appreciated the anxiety uh, that all had uh, with that. So we made that a top priority. And we all agreed on that. We wrote it down um, so there was no ambiguity. Uh, two or three days later, one of my partners went up to the uh, window and started to uh, push a patient care coordinator uh, to try and get vasectomy patients in faster. Um, and um, I had to uh, say, no, wait, time out. We sat down and we said the priority here, uh, what was critical to the quality of our practice and the needs of the community um, was to get the access for the elevated PSA person. Um, and so it isn't that things are mutually exclusive, but you do need to have a common sense of uh, purpose. You need to have your arms around what is quality for you and your practice. Um, and, you know, it's important then to have that as your uh, beacon, if you will, to guide where you're going, because all of the financial aspects exist basically to support that. I agree. So I, I'm, I'm sitting here taking notes and quite a few of the things that you're saying is are really, it's really resonating with me. And one of the things that you're mentioning is everyone has different definitions of what the high quality care is. So we, we identified what it is for our referring physicians. We identified what it is for our community. Now for patients, do you think they have a different definition for high quality care? Um, I think you have to be very aware of um, what they need and what they want. And uh, the challenge is how best to do that. So as a chief medical officer, we actually had a, a patient relations committee. Um, it was basically a cross-section of the community 
uh, that afforded us the opportunity um, to listen. And I underline the word listen. Um, docs are pretty good about talking and we're not always uh, as good about listening. Um, and it was important to get that feedback. Now, in a practice, I don't know that it is practical um, to have a, a patient relations type committee. So I think a surrogate for that can be your staff. And too many times it's the docs that get in the room and talk about these things. Um, it helps build a culture if the staff also um, has some input. They are also patients. They also um, uh, are having perhaps more time with patients than you are as, as, as a doc. They're listening to their neighbors, um, et cetera. And particularly as physicians, if we're not living in the community, it becomes important to hear that, that voice. Um, so if it's practical, if your practice is big enough to invite some folks in, um, that's great. Um, you do need, however it works for you, uh, to have that input from, from patients. And I think that's incredibly valuable, um, both directions. I agree. And that kind of moves us forward to talking about our organizations as um, kind of living, breathing entities. And really, your organization is, is dictated by your culture. And that's what you're saying, just to make sure that all of the parties, the interesting parties, are, are in the same, the same space discussing what we need to do as an organization. So if we're talking about culture, we're talking about people. And so we are in the people business. We're providing care to people. We are people. We are. Um, we have employees that are also people and have needs. So, what would you, do you believe? This is true that really, it's a it's a people business. We're delivering care, but the underlying business is culture and people. Oh, I I feel a hundred percent that culture trumps everything. Okay. Um, when I made uh, the transition to um, an administrative position, one of the first lessons I heard was money only gets you so much. Um, it's the culture uh, that really keeps people. I think uh, all of us are experiencing with COVID tremendous stress on our staff. The money that hospitals are putting out um, to try to uh, attract and retain particularly nurses, um, is unbelievable today. But if you step back and you say, well, why do the nurses that you have stay? Um, it's because of the culture. And I think just think of yourself. Um, do you want to work in a toxic culture? Um, no. Um, and so um, I think, and this is why as we have this discussion, I, I would put the finances at the end because you have to know what you're trying to achieve with quality and you have to have the culture because all the money in the world can't buy that. So trust, I always think, creeps into the house and leaves at a gallop. And so um, you have to create an uh, environment uh, of mutual respect. Um, we are fortunate in that we have a robust family medicine residency at our institution and we handle um, a lot of uh, refugees. And so uh, there is the opportunity to enhance our uh, cultural literacy um, and uh, sensitivity, um, diversity, um, whether it's gender identity or other things become very important and are not necessarily in the wheelhouse of many urologists. You don't necessarily get that in your residency training. Um, people have to want to come to work. They have to feel as though um, they're making uh, a difference. Um, now, there has to be accountability. But that accountability also has to extend to you as 
uh, a urologist. Um, and so trying to understand what the staff value, uh, how to keep them engaged, mission critical. And it's foundational to maintaining a, a culture of safety. Um, and it, and it, it does dovetail also um, into uh, communication, which I, I think we probably will talk about in a minute or two. I agree. So um, to establish a culture, to change a culture in order to get all parties on the same same wavelength with delivering the type of care, the quality of care we want to involves a lot of communication. Um, and communication, I mean, everyone's style is slightly different. As you mentioned before, diversity and cultural changes, it's, it's important to have clear communication. So is, is that one of the main foundations to making all of this work? Or what do you think about communication? Well, I think it's a critical part of creating the culture um, that we want. Mm -hmm. And um, I would often say to folks that if a genie came out of a bottle and said, you know what, you get one wish as mm -hmm. a chief medical officer or as the managing partner uh, of my practice, what would it be? Well, it would be perfect communication. Um, Mark Twain, I think, uh, said uh, the biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it's actually uh, taken place. Yes. Um, so many of the disasters that I might have to deal with, large and small, um, mm -hmm. are an issue with communication. Um, getting it communicated to our nurses, um, what dose of BCG we want to use or um, follow up um, instructions. Um, communication is um, just of, of critical Im importance. And, um, you know, we get um, used to giving orders, um, you know, uh, doctor's orders. Um, and um, there does, have to be some hierarchy, but um, again, I would oftentimes think to myself, even though I might have positional authority, the moment I use it, I lose it. And so um, we have to develop a way where we listen. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy. Studies have shown that if, uh, they, if you uh, video a doctor in an exam room talking to a patient, I think uh, they typically interrupt within about 20 seconds. Um, we don't always listen very well. Uh, that's with patients. I'm not sure we listen very well um, with our staff um, either. And there's a great book, uh, How Doctors Think. It's written by Jerome Groupman, who's a professor at Harvard. It was written a few years ago, but it's a great way to hold up a mirror and understand who we are um, and some of the challenges we have because our greatest strengths can also be our greatest uh, weaknesses. So we have to learn to become active listeners um, and we have to um, be careful because silence kills. And um, so um, communication within a practice is gonna be critical. Um, you need to have folks being able to step up and talk to you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of my greatest um, privileges, my boss at Yale, Bernie Litton, um, was a tremendous surgeon. Um, but the thing that was best about Bernie was you could be headed into an operation, um, a big case, and a medical student could say to him, well, Dr. Litton, why are you doing it that way? Uh, couldn't you do it better if you did X, Y, or Z? And Bernie would look up and he would say, oh, you're right, in his British accent. Um, and I always admired that. First, that the medical student had the safety to speak up. Mm -hmm. But secondly, that Bernie would listen um, and respond. And, and so if we're going to be successful at delivering high quality care, um, I would really advocate for working on our communication skills and in particularly our active listening skills. I agree. So um, 
as we're talking about the different generations, we know as a, as a whole, urologist, we're, we're getting older. And there's an entire new generation that's coming in that definitely communicates differently than we have in the past. Have you had any or seen any resources of how to communicate throughout the different generations? I mean, in, in my world, the, the newest uh, millennials even, uh, there's a lot more text. There's a lot more electronic communication versus the handwritten or verbal face-to-face -face communication. What are your thoughts about that? Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, and uh, regrettably, I'm um, 68. Um, it's a very exciting time. Um, some people bring their hands over medicine. I think it's just a gas. And I wish I was 40 years younger uh, because the power that folks will have at their fingertips will be great. And um, it is a little bit of a struggle. Um, you know, we are looking, we've had to cancel the annual meeting for the AUA the last couple of years. Well, before that, I was saying to my colleagues, we can't depend on the annual meeting forever, uh, that the younger generation is not going to see the same value in it that my uh, generation uh, has had. So um, with social media and everything else, there are other ways to connect and communicate that uh, older individuals uh, perhaps struggle with. Mm -hmm. And um, working to bridge that gap. But that gets back to the listening. That gets back to the sensitivity around um, cultural differences. Um, they're all connected. And uh, one of the things that COVID has taught us, for instance, communication with patient, leveraging your IT system, what an underutilized tool that is in many practices. And um, again, I hate to stereotype, my generation will typically not think or utilize that as much as someone who is much younger. Good for them, bad for us. Um, it, again, it just requires communication and a constant sense of common culture and, and, and goals to get over that. I agree. Well, let, let, let's talk about one of our final topics, finance. So at the end of the day, medicine is a business, right? So if you are hospital employed, if you're academic, if you're private practice, you still have to run your business. So as we make modifications and we communicate and we create the culture we want, how important is the financial health of the practices of the of the centers in order to give this high quality care? Well, you know, in administrative circles, I would oftentimes want to pick my pen up and stick it in my eye when I would hear people say no margin, no mission. Um, however, it's the absolute truth. And um, you can't do everything for everybody. Um, that's why I go back to the first part of our discussion when we talked about the laundry list of what the components of quality uh, care are. It has to be sustainable and you have to prioritize. I mean, that's just what you have to do. So um, the um, business aspects become very important, but you have to do those other things first. They can't, the business things can't do it all for you. I think it is important that you have to be engaged with this. And again, when I went through residency training, nobody told me about the finances. And I can remember my first year uh, when I joined the practice, just struggling with the concepts of uh, profit versus cash. And, uh, um, you know, I came from a very humble background. My parents didn't uh, have a lot of money. So these things were new to me, but I was engaged and I taught myself and I found a mentor. You don't need an MBA, um, but you need to know the material that's in the, the MBA program. And so I think what well, the American Urologic Association is doing with this uh, business and urology institute concept is um, really important. And you can't ignore it. 
even if you're not going to be the managing partner, even if you're saying, oh, I'm in a 20 person group, um, no, um, this is your livelihood. Um, and, and you have to understand what's going on uh, in that practice. You have to have financial uh, literacy, as it's uh, often called. And uh, even if you are not the chairperson of the department, even if you're not the managing partner, you have to be able to influence. Um, now, the other thing I would say when it comes to the finances, it isn't enough to just understand the finances of your practice. You also have to understand the finances of the hospital. Even if you're in private practice, even if you're in academics, you don't live in a vacuum. And I would always be disappointed when um, a person would come in to interview for a job and not have done any research on the finances of the hospital. So, um, but you have to understand what days cash on hand mean. You have to understand um, time to um, a final um, bill, um, et cetera. In today's environment, um, you have to get maximum efficiency from your practice. And uh, I went off to Belmont University for a few days. The Massey School of Business offered a course on lean. Now, some places lean becomes, or the Toyota production system becomes almost a religion. No, I'm not interested in that. But there are a lot of good tools in the Toyota production system that can be applied to a practice. And that helps you uh, achieve the things you want to do um, without um, sacrificing quality uh, and maintaining your, your income. And it's hard today because we're kind of straddling a fence between um, traditional volume, uh, making widgets and getting paid for each widget um, versus uh, value or taking risk. Um, so you must understand the costs uh, in your practice uh, and how that impacts. But at the end of the day, all of this, you have to make high quality care, however you define it, sustainable. Um, so uh, I would probably wrap up my discussion here by just saying you have to get involved. You have to become financially literate. Um, there are many different ways of doing that. But again, hats off to the AUA for starting to make that more readily available. I agree completely. Um, we do a great job of training the next generation to practice medicine clinically, but not really training them on all of the business nuances of what they will need to learn and to be open and flexible. So as you commented, yes, we have always been fee for service in my generation and the generations that are coming behind me. It's you get paid for widgets, depends on what your RV use, your output. But as we move forward um, and we see overall in, in the country where the momentum is going, we're talking about value-based care. Uh, who defines that value? How do we define it for ourselves? And I also think it's, it's very important that the AUA is, is reaching out because if we're the ones defining it, instead of allowing someone else to define it for us, we are the ones in control of our future and our patient's care. Uh, what do you think about the timing of financial literacy? Because right now, I mean, really in residency, you may get a lecture or two, but it's really now that we're putting this, this information together and, and sharing to, with our cohorts about how do, you, how do you learn about the business of medicine? How, how do you learn the language? Because it is a different language. I think uh, as we go through the system, we're, we're taught focus on the patient, focus on the patient. And we get out and we're like, focus on the patient, but pay your bills. So at what point do you think we should start introducing this? Like, should it be in medical school? Should it be in, like, at what point do we have this conversation? Well, um, look, uh, particularly in America, um, the finances are intertwined uh, with care and you really need to begin at medical school. You can't put your head in the sand and not recognize that um, finances are critical, not just from the doctor perspective, but from the patient. 
So it's an eye opener for me as I start to uh, look at Medicare. Um, and now I'm seeing the cost of drugs and now I'm having to pay out of pocket for things um, that, you know, for the last 40 years, I've been on a health plan or whatever that my institution has provided and that I just blissfully go along. So um, there is a reality here that we're faced with that I didn't see when I was in the UK. Um, I'm not advocating for national health care per se, um, but um, finances are part of American medicine, always will be, and you better start to get educated early on, creating a sensitivity for not just the physician perspective, but also the impact on our patients. Um, and that's where the patient uh, advocacy committee or input from patients is important to keep us sensitized. Um, you know, um, cost of some of the medications we have are crazy. Um, and if we're not sensitive, the fact, how, how cruel is it to recommend a patient a treatment uh, and then have them face the reality that they can't afford it? I agree. One of the things you said, we're all going to be a patient one day. So we have to look at both sides of the equation. We really do. Well, this has been great. I, I really want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. To, to have this conversation. I just kind of wanted to go over a few of the, the main points that we've made over the last 30 minutes or so. We've really identified what the components of high quality care are. We've also discussed and dug into culture and it really trumps everything. We're in a people business and the people are what create the culture. We've also discussed the fact that communication is key, whether it's patient, hospital, clinician, payers, communication, is, is what's going to, to allow us to deliver that care in an effective manner. And also finance. We really need to understand the business of medicine, the business of urology. And we need to make sure that it's taught at an earlier age so that we all have the language, we all have the insight, and we can make sure that our systems are going to be structured to allow us to move forward together in the future. So again, I want to thank everyone who's listening and especially thank, thank Dr. Green. Thank you very much. And Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jennifer, for the invitation. Um, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, make AUA Leadership in Business your go-to podcast. Subscribe today by searching AUA Leadership in Business on your favorite podcast app, and enhance your leadership and business education needs.